morning, everyone. Uh, we, I have a pleasant announcement to start us off with, and that is that a friend has stepped forward and offered us a challenge grant to uh, make up the amount of money that the program needs to teach uh, PAX 164B this spring. So uh, we don't really need to raise all that much, and I think I would say at this point that the likelihood is greater that we actually will be offering it um, in the spring. It's good. I, I am glad about that because I want to have like the whole year block for the website and, and for other things. So I feel really good about that. Uh, I've sent you some course web announcements with a lot of, of fun things that are going on. Not that. And uh, I want to mention one other we're getting ready to send you and bring you, and that is uh, the, the nonprofit for nonviolence education called META is setting up an office near campus very soon, i.e., tomorrow morning. And uh, we're going to have several internships available there. And we're looking for a, a technical person who, you know what I mean, a technical person. Technically, we're all people, but uh, <laughs> a person who could help us set up our network. For example, we have three techn technologically challenged uh, staff people, myself and two others. So we, we're looking for somebody who can help us get the network set up. If you have a person in your life who knows how to do that. All right, so this, uh, here's the plan. To the, we have now discussed the climax of the freedom struggle, which was the Salt Satyagraha, and in particular, within that climax, the raid on the Dharsana assault pans, which we could consider the climax of the climax. And it, that was the nonviolent moment of the freedom struggle. So in terms of liberating India from foreign domination and in wider terms saying no to foreign domination in general, in other words, to end the colonial – era in human, in human history, it all took place on that one day in the spring of 1930. Two people gave up their lives. Many others were brutally injured and it was all over. So nobody promised us a rose garden. You know, nobody said that nonviolence wouldn't hurt. But considering what was gained and the amount of pain, it was a bargain. You have to talk about it in those terms. And uh, so the reason that we march around today every now and then, in especially in the springtime when we get kind of uh, – we have a lot of energy. We pick up placards and march around and protest things, and which is, you know, a perfect a thing to do. And one of the things that we go around saying these days is, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. And the reason that we say that, that would have been unthinkable if Gandhi had not uh, risen up and said, no, yours is not the only civilization. Other human beings are also human. We also have a culture. We have a way to live and uh, we can work it out together cooperatively. And it's been said that about 50 countries at least were under the yoke of colonial domination and are now technically liberated thanks to what happened on that afternoon and the buildup to that event. That is not to say that the problem is over. Your human exploitation isn't over. We're in at least one, maybe two phases of domination past frank colonialism. But at least at one point, the human race stood up and said, no, this isn't okay. Now we have to figure out whom we're talking to and how to do it again because colonialism is still going on in much subtler ways. But at least we stood up and said it can't go on in this – obvious way anymore. So what, we're, what I'd like to do today is run through, and it really is sort of a run through, you know, kind of thing where if you drop your pencil, you miss 50 years <laughs> of history. You're going to run through the conclusion to the, to the end of Gandhi's uh, mortal life, highlighting some key events in our usual style. And on Thursday, go back a little bit to oh, about 1920 so that we can pick up the story of Abdul Ghaffar Khan because it is so critically important for us that we had a Muslim 
nonviolence uh, advocate who spiritually was almost on a level of Gandhi, at least he was for his own people. He would, of course, deny that. Uh, but he's a person with whom I have a slight indirect um, connection. I got a friend of mine to do an interview with Abdul Ghaffar Khan in uh, Delhi, and I think it was the last interview ever taken of him. He died shortly after that. And I'm the only one that has the film. So <laughs> if someone would like to purchase rights to this film, we need exactly, I think, $3,000 more to teach PAX 164B in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, going, going, gone. Uh, <laughs> um, now, I sent you last night a review list of terms that you could be looking at for the ID portion of the midterm. And in case you don't like uh, cyberspace, I have a few copies of it here also. So, hello. Oh, here they are. Thank you, Jordan. Oh, I didn't realize they'd be blue. That's so nice. Thank you. You're not staying? Okay. So this is the uh, description of those internships that I mentioned. The internships are blue. The review terms are white. Um, so we'll talk about those, of course, the review terms next Tuesday. I'm giving them to you a week in advance. And also what I'm going to uh, give you is an example of how to answer an ID. And I think with that we'll be ready to go for the midterm. Okay? Is there any questions now bef before I take the bit out of my teeth and launch into it? Shall I? I didn't discuss the term paper. No, it's way too soon for that. You need to concern yourself with the midterm. But when I do the diagnostic of the midterm, which is the meeting, I try usually to get the midterms back to you to the next class day. That is, if you're going to take it on the 19th, that's a Thursday, I'm going to try and get it back in your hands on Tuesday. Did you know that, <laughs> Eli and Laura? It's <laughs> uh, it may be difficult because I actually have to go to a conference that weekend. But um, by Tuesday or Thursday, Anyway, by next, by the following Tuesday, we'll have a sort of diagnostic overview of what I failed to communicate well uh, to get you prepared for the midterm. And at that point, I'll also hand out a sheet that will kind of guide you towards uh, doing the term paper. Okay? But if you want to think about it al already, and I know that some of you are, look for an area that we have talked about but have not satisfied you on. Well, you know, something that interested you but we couldn't get to the bottom of. That's usually the best place to start. What is heart unity all about? You know, what is Nagler's law? How does quantum theory fit into all of this? Which incidentally is not going to play a very big role in the midterm. <laughs> yeah, I see some nods of approval on that. Yes, derive Heisenberg's wave equation in 15 lines. Uh, so that's what I would be thinking of if you want to be thinking about the term paper now, and it's not a bad idea. Okay. Yeah? Um, I was just wondering what the format for the midterm is. The format for the midterm is very simple. There will be two questions. One will be a set of IDs, and one will be an essay. Okay. And in both cases, there will be choice. One of the choices uh, for that essay will undoubtedly be both, and there will be a similar one on the final, take – the South Africa phase or the India phase of Gandhi's career, run through it, pick out highlights, and tell us what we can learn from each of these events. So it won't be a very satisfactory answer if you just say this happened, this happened, this happened. And it won't be very satisfactory if you say nonviolence works in the following way. We want to connect what actually happened to the general principles. All right. Very good. So the result of the salt satyagraha and the, the British reacted very badly to it. First they didn't react enough and then they reacted too much. First they underestimated Gandhi's power and thought that uh, the thing would blow over and they, didn't, they decided to ignore it. And then it, it uh, went out of all proportion and they had to react. And you had a classic example of the paradox of repression. And you had tens of thousands of people in jail 
and uh, the British were really starting to not look like the image of themselves that they project and did project into the world as a, a civilized uh, <coughs> nation and people. And it was getting sticky, and so they decided to do what regimes always do in these situations, which is to convene a meeting and talk about it. So they – but they didn't want to have Gandhi at that meeting. So they said, let's have a big round table and everybody can come except people who are in prison. And of course, Gandhi had been in prison for quite some time. So they had a – they had round table conference one, which was a total farce. I mean, without Gandhi, nobody knew what to say and it didn't matter what they said anyway. So then they realized they had to have Gandhi and they said, please come to London. And he said, oh, I can't. I'm in prison. So they say, we'll let you out. He said, I don't want to come. <laughs> I like it here. <laughs> you know, I'm reading a good book. We have our prayer meeting every day and I get 12 almonds a day and I'm, <laughs> I'm just pigging out here. Uh, and uh, so they had to actually sort of beg him to come out of prison. I've been looking recently at ways in which the nonviolence paradigm turns our expectations upside down and reverses normal expect expectations. This would be a good example of that. When jail going becomes a positive pleasure and jail leaving becomes something that you have to be cajoled into doing, it became a bargain for him. In fact, he once said that I drove my hardest bargains from behind bars. And that's, that turns our expectations inside out. This is next semester, knock wood, or if not in the fall, <laughs> we'll be talking about the power of vulnerability. And it came up particularly in the – People's Power Revolution in the Philippines, 1987. Um, but they begged him to come out and it took him so long that by the time he was ready to come out of prison, they had to s uh, get a special train to take him from Yerafta to the dock, put him on the, the boat. And this becomes a very well advertised and well known and iconic uh, uh, period in his life, a great adventure. He, uh, he needed to ha be drinking goat's milk at the time, so the only way to get fresh goat's milk on board ship was to have two goats with him. So it's like a classic example of Gandhi doing something concrete that had a huge symbolic resonance. You know, there's no better way that he could advertise that it matters how you live and what you eat and you should live lightly on the earth. And if people are being unkind to cows, which had become the case, I'm not going to um, – I'm going to boycott their products and I'm going to drink goat's milk. And so he goes all over Europe with these two goats in tow and that attracted a lot of media attention. And he was very famous by this time. When he landed in Marseille, a journalist came up to him and said, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, I think it would be a very nice idea. And that, that's now you see this written on walls everywhere. This is a famous uh, riposte, famous rejoinder of this. Uh, the conference itself was a f complete uh, farce, again, of a different kind. What the British did was they stacked the meeting against him and they did everything possible to play what they thought was their strongest card, which was if we leave India, there's going to be communal riots and it will erupt in a civil war. It'll be Sunnis versus Shias all over again. I'm sorry, I'm being a little anachronistic. But uh, that was what they were claiming was their main reason for staying in India at that point, which is interesting because prior to that they had said, you are a lesser breed without the law. If we go, you won't have any civilization and you, know, you won't even know how to make tea. We didn't even grow it before we got there. Uh, but now they have to put it on a, on a different basis and that was interesting. And it provides us with a very good example of a topic that I call work versus work, which I admit is not a terribly uh, skillful way to express it. Sometimes I call it work versus success. And it's a very important tool that we need to evaluate how nonviolent events <laughs> work. And that is – they can or they, they may or may not work in the sense that they may or may not do exactly what we want them to do. 
but they will always work in the sense that they will change things for the better. They will set up new relationships. They will advertise that there's a new kind of power uh, that people can have recourse to. In some way, they will change things for the better. And very often, the work that they do is much more impressive than the quote, work, unquote, that they fail to do. And we've discussed a good example of this right in connection with the salt satyagraha. I, th I think we discussed it. I discussed it with somebody in the last five days. I can't remember who. The fact is, well, there are two funny things about the salt satyagraha. One is, here's Gandhi turning the world upside down to get the right to manufacture their own salt. He wasn't even taking salt at that time. You know, it meant absolutely nothing to him personally. The second is that as a, an attempt to reverse the salt laws, it just about completely failed. The concession that the regime actually made at the end of that uh, uh, campaign was just symbolic. It really – they kept control of the salt monopoly. So we would have to say this event did not work. On the other hand, uh, and this we did talk about last week, that was the nonviolent moment that showed that the British could no longer control India. And you remember T Toynbee's famous formulation, he made it impossible for us to go on ruling India, but he made it possible for us to leave without rancor and without humiliation. Yes, Joy? They kept control of that monopoly. Yeah, I mean, as far as I know, the Darsan assault pans were still operating in British hands after that. And it just kind of petered out. And at the end of it, there hadn't on paper, not much had changed. But didn't they make their own salt? They made their own salt during the campaign. And I'm sure some people went on making it. But the point was to get it legalized. <laughs> the, the atrocity was that you could come in and make a law saying you can't breathe your air, you can't drink your water, you can't grow your cloth. You're depending on us to do it. Uh, I have been recently noticing how far this has gone, this commodification, or I guess you call it commoditization, taking things provided by nature, taking control of them and turning them into saleable commodities. Uh, we have billboards around the town where I live, or near which I live, uh, in which real estate agents are advertising their services. You know, so far so good. I have nothing against real estate agents advertising on billboards. But a, uh, a formula, a slogan has become very popular with them recently. And say if you're a realtor and you're selling property in Petaluma, you have a picture of yourself s smiling, cheerful, looking sort of like Marlboro Man without a cigarette. A and it will say, I sell Petaluma. Now, this is really bad. They, Petaluma is not a thing, you know. It's a city. People live there. Uh, my son lived there for a while. This is getting serious, you know. <laughs> really, this is getting real. And you don't own it and you can't sell it. Now, of course, they don't mean it literally. But it's not only what we mean literally that affects our consciousness. This is one of the things that progressives and the left have not caught on to and they don't understand it as well as regressive and conservative individuals do. And that's one of the reasons that uh, conservatives are so much more effective right now. So, okay. You know, as you know, every day you have to be subjected to one of my rants. That, that was it for today, <laughs> I hope. Um, but it's this idea of taking something that is natural and that's available in the world and making a commodity out of it where what then becomes important is the buying and the selling and not the commodity, not the relationship with the people, not the networks of relationships that spring up around providing this commodity.
Yet one more example, you can stand that this is exactly what we've done to the Tigris and the Euphrates. People have been living in Iraq, what is now Iraq, for 7,000 years, and they've worked out ways of dealing with a scarce commodity called water that comes from those two rivers, and it's been fine. They have not had a war over water in that Mesopotamian region in all of this time. But when we occupied the country, the first thing we did was uh, privatize the water, make a commodity out of it and teach some Iraqis how to sell it to one another. So that was the real outrage and that was not redressed. It was they did not succeed in changing the law that said Indians are not allowed to make salt. It has to be made by British monopolies. So it was a complete failure on that technical level. On the other hand, it accomplished much more than that goal that it had set out for. It liberated India, basically. It was just a matter of time. The Roundtable Conference was not dissimilar. It, uh, apparently, Gandhi gave one of the best speeches of his life. He spoke for about two hours at the, at the actual uh, conference uh, when his turn came. We don't have that speech, unfortunately, because the British uh, refused to allow anybody to record it or take notes. But William Shirer, uh, Gandhi's favorite Western journalist, he was there. And uh, we have some idea what he said. But there was no way that you could come out of that conference with a different arrangement. So Gandhi goes in saying, let's, uh, let's be partners. You're a great country. We're a great country. Uh, let just imagine what we could do together in the world. But the British were intransigent and they just trotted out one, one stool pigeon after another. <laughs> one uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? One puppet. One puppet after another who said, oh, no, please don't leave us. If you, you, know, if you do, those Hindus will kill us or those Muslims will kill us and we need you. So in terms of doing its work, uh, really ne renegotiating the colonial domination, it failed. On the other hand, Gandhi made very good use of the time. He met a lot of people. He had the opportunity to meet Charlie Chaplin, but he had no idea who Charlie Chaplin was. So that was called off. He gave a radio broadcast to this country, uh, which was, was a very important message. It's in the context of that talk where he gave his famous definition of God. It, it goes, I do dimly perceive that whilst all around me is ever changing, ever dying, there is underlying all that change a living power that changes not, which holds all together, which creates, dissolves, and recreates. This – and since this power – this, this eternal force or power, this eternal law or power is God. And since all else that I see merely with my senses will not and cannot persist, God alone is. And is – I didn't know I was going to do this, but here we are. <laughs> is this power benevolent or malevolent? I see it as purely benevolent, for I do see that – in the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence, I conclude that God is truth, love, light. He is love. He is the supreme good. So that was a – that won't be on the midterm, but, uh, <laughs> but that was a really uh, famous uh, – statement that he made in this radio broadcast to America. Another very telling event was his meeting with the Lancashire mill workers that I think we mentioned last week. He had put like about four or 5,000 people out of work by boycotting British cloth. They were very angry with him. The minute he heard they were very angry, he said, I want to go and talk to them. And he gave them this very, very astute analysis. He says, look, you know, the system – that your country set up in India is – he didn't use the term, but he said it's not sustainable. Don't even think of going back to that system. It will not work anymore. Think of who is really exploiting both of us. You as an underpaid mill worker, me as uh, the leader of the Indian masses. 
that you have, okay, I'm sorry you have 5,000 unemployed. I'm really sorry. I have 200,000 unemployed. You know where your next meal is coming from. My people do not. And at the end, they were, they were just overjoyed. Uh, and it was a great example of how on the person-to-person -person level you could overcome really deeply felt hostilities. But so there you have it. He, he made terrific use of the time in London on the human level, but as a political uh, uh, event, the conference was a complete flop. And when he goes back to India, gets off the ship, he is met at the dock and arrested. He said, I went from His Majesty's hotel to His Majesty's prison. Oh, one other neat little anecdote I guess we shouldn't pass over. He was invited to have tea with His Majesty the King Emperor. And uh, they asked him to, to please wear Western clothes when he came in. And he said, I'm going to wear what I'm wearing. And if His Majesty doesn't want to see me, that's okay with me. So they decided to have him in. And uh, he was wearing what he called his minus fours. You know, because British in, in the Caribbean wear, wear these long cutoffs that were called plus fours. So he said, I'm wearing my minus fours. And when he came out, they uh, – around him and said, Mr. Gandhi, don't you think you were a bit underdressed for the occasion? And he said, His Majesty had on quite enough for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, it really – it shows you what a sense of tact that he had that uh, the, the king actually tried to get him involved into a, in a political discussion. They were sitting there having tea and he said, why did you demonstrate against my – the Prince of Wales? And he said, we will not discuss politics on this occasion. So actually – he was more polite than His Majesty the King Emperor. He had a finer sense of social protocol, though to look at him, you would not have guessed it. So he comes back and is thrown into prison. He comes back to find that all of his co-workers are in prison and he's also thrown in prison. And uh, the next event of interest for us which I've started is, is popularly known as the Epic Fast. You'll actually – there are other he, – he's going to be fasting quite a bit now for the next 10 or 15 years. Sometimes people say the Calcutta Fast, which was so well dramatized in the movie, they call that the Epic Fast. It's, I, it doesn't matter. But there was an Epic Fast. In 1932, he was uh, in prison in Yaravda. Uh, jail and uh, the government announced that the way they were going to deal with untouchability was to set up separate electorates. And as we've mentioned, Gandhi felt that this would formalize the division between the caste and the non-caste Hindus. And what you wanted to do was the exact opposite. You wanted to breach uh, that barrier. And he felt this in very deeply in his heart that this was unacceptable, totally unacceptable. And he had only one mechanism open to him because he was in prison. He was not allowed to do political work. And that was to announce to a stunned India on September – September is an important month in his life – September 20th of 1932, I have gone on a perpetual fast unto death against this arrangement. And immediately everyone in the country was uh, galvanized. What are we going to do about this? It wasn't too difficult to uh, uh, rally many of his co-workers. But there were, it's interesting that there were two parties whom he completely failed to reach with this device. And one was the Raj. They did not appreciate the depth of feeling that he had. They did not appreciate that this was a religious issue for him. They didn't quite believe him when he said the still voice within had told him to do this. And um, they regarded it as a political ploy because that's what it would have been for them. They did not understand that this was stage three on that famous escalation curve of conflict, dehumanization and that he was laying down his life for this. Now the other party that he was unable to reach was Dr. Ambedkar. 
who is really going to be his biggest adversary in the whole Harijan movement, which takes off the rest of his life. Ambedkar was a uh, Harijan, uh, the, the term hadn't been brought in quite yet. He was a, uh, untouchable by birth, uh, but he got a law degree and uh, rose up through the ranks, married a Brahmin woman, interestingly enough. They would say, it's all for us untouchables, but, but he wouldn't marry one. And uh, he never got reconciled to what Gandhi was doing and never totally appreciated him. Uh, and in the end, just to skip down a little bit, he will eventually bring many, many untouchables out of the Hindu fold altogether. And that's one of the main reasons that you still have Buddhists in India today. So you've got about 15, 20,000 untouchables to convert to Buddhism as a way of saying we will not put up with this. Um, but anyway, Ambedkar couldn't be reached. Now, the, the, okay, the technical details of what's going on here are a little complicated and I'm not going to hold you responsible for all of them. But they worked out, Gandhi and his fellow workers in the prison while he was fasting and they knew they didn't have a lot of time. He was not young anymore. The fast was telling on his health rather more quickly than other fasts had done. So they had to work quickly. And they hammered out an agreement whereby uh, the uh, caste Hindus would uh, – it, it's, it's really complicated. But the upshot of it was this, that they were going to put something in place for 10 years. And th what it symbolized was distrust on the part of the Harijans, on the part of the untouchables, whatever, of the – of the caste Hindus. And Gandhi said, um, no, we can, the five years maximum. And at the, at the end when they had it almost signed, Gandhi was so weak that all he could say was, five years or my life. And Ambedkar says, well, I guess we lose you then. Everybody else was deeply shocked. Gandhi prepared to die and they went off and stayed up all night long and worked on that guy and uh, hammered away at him and hammered out an agreement which they hoped, against hope, that Gandhi would accept. It's now the sixth day, uh, September 26th. They went back to him in the morning. They put the papers in front of him and they stood there praying that it would be okay. And he, he looked at them and said, excellent, <laughs> this last sort of gasp. And that was the Yarabda Pact. And so they did sign on to it. And I think the important things to note here are that Gandhi had much more trouble in his own party than he had with the British on this issue and on many others. The fast was not aimed at the British who totally didn't get it. It was it, the point of it was to prick the conscience of the Indian people. So – in a sense, well, I wanted to point out one thing before I conclude with this, taking some of Gnanda's observations. Uh, the British premier and his advisors were unable to appreciate Gandhi's deeply emotional and religious approach to the problem. This is something that we've noticed again and again and again. They're operating at a political level and they just don't get it that there's a deeper level on which Gandhi is operating. Gandhi, however, did not have to justify his fast to anybody except to his own consciousness, conscience or, as he put it, to his maker. I mean, there was, there was a part of him which was absolutely, as he put it, between himself and God. And he would make these decisions and that just plain wasn't anything you could do about that. So that there was always that dimension to his life. I, I've been thinking of a couple of uh, essay questions that are a little bit different from ones that I've used before. I haven't run this by the staff yet, but uh, <laughs> one of them would be, uh, what is the relationship between Gandhi's spirituality and his political behavior? And another one might be, pick out four or five really salient characteristics of Gandhi as a revolutionist. 
what, what makes him special or different as a leader of a revolutionary movement. But if, if you do get one of those questions, this, this would definitely be one of those characteristics that ultimately there were some issues which were between him and, as we would like to put it perhaps, between him and his conscience and nobody could intervene. And I remember the governor, uh, the previous governor of the state of New York decided to get rid of the death penalty and people came to him. Lawyers can't defend it and criminologists can't defend it. He said, I don't need any defense. He said, this, I will not be, I will not preside over execution as long as I'm governor of New York. You want to execute people, vote me out of office. So it was that kind of thing. And Gandhi had uh, a number of issues that were like that for him. Um, they, the government even uh, offered to let him out of jail to give him a comfortable place to fast in. <laughs> but he said, no, I prefer to fast in jail. Um, the, the leaders' conference uh, included names that we're going to meet with again and again, like Raja Gopalachari and Rajendra Prasad and others. Um, but Ambedkar was a stubborn advocate of se separate electorates. That's the odd thing. Uh, hold on one second, George. So you have this odd configuration where the British is saying Harijans need separate electorates. Ambedkar, who has set himself up as their representative, said, oh, yes, that's exactly what we need because they're both thinking of it politically. Gandhi is thinking, what is the repercussion of this? We are saying that in our polity, in, the, in our political structure, these are two different communities. And that's fatal. There's enough tension between us already. Okay. Joy, you had a question? <coughs> well, it, it's complicated. I can't even quite remember how it goes. But um, um, Bedkar, basically, his position was he did not trust the caste union. And Gandhi was saying, part of the deal is you have to trust us. If you don't trust us, we're not members of the same community. That's what Gandhi was holding out for. And again, Ambedkar wants a guarantee on paper written into the Constitution. It has to be solved on a political level. Sean? How do you know I'm not entirely sure about that. I think he was a, he was a charismatic person. He had a law degree which was rare in that community. And he was totally dedicated to the cause of his people. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay, I'm really glad you asked me that question. He was dedicated to the cause of his people as a separate item. Gandhi was dedicated to the cause of the Harijans as a member of the human race. For Gandhi, there was no such thing as a, a win-lose interaction. There was no such thing as a zero-sum conclusion. There was no such thing. We've discussed this early on in terms of you know, the underlying faith that an advocate of principle of nonviolence has is that there is no irreducible conflict. In order for you to thrive, I do not have to suffer. That's his whole worldview. In order for the Indians to be free, the British do not have to be hurt. That's what Toynbee said. No rancor, no humiliation. We just stop dominating you. So that was really the difference. And thank you for <coughs> prodding me into clarifying this. Ambedkar wants everything for the Harijans, period, separately. So if it means taking them out of the Hindu fold where they have been, albeit uncomfortably, for thousands of years, okay. So be it. But Gandhi says, no, we can work this out to everybody's benefit. And so they thought, Ambedkar at least thought, that he was anti-Harija. It's so frustrating because they could not see that their benefit lay with the benefit of everybody. They thought that he was against them by wanting it to be in that larger framework. Yeah, please. Was there yes, there was also him in, at a, on another occasion. He's writing to Gandhi and he, he said, uh, we have to get rid of the caste system. And Gandhi said, no, we have to get rid of high and low. Yeah, so that's another thing that made Ambedkar look very good because he's advocating getting rid of the caste system and everybody can relate to that. 
Now, what Gandhi's advocating would require a growth in consciousness of the human race. And we, okay, we keep the caste system, but we don't exploit it. That's very hard. One of my mentors at this university was uh, Alain Renoir. And uh, as you know, I love dropping names. And his father was Jean Renoir, who wrote Grand – did the film Grand Illusion, Grand Illusions. And Alain Renoir, when he was a boy, he had a minor role in that movie. So he was hanging around on the set. And he noticed that uh, you know, there were a cast of thousands. You were either German – you had a German uniform or a French uniform. It's all the same people. You had a German uniform or a French uniform. Every tenth uniform was an officer. So provided you were the right size, you come by and if you're number 10, you were wearing a lieutenant's uniform and not a private uniform. Okay? Within one week, Alain, who was very shrewd in these matters, within one week, Alain noticed that at lunchtime, when they took a break, all the officers, that is the ordinary stiffs who happened to be wearing officer's uniform, they would congregate on one side of the set <laughs> and all of the enlisted men didn't go there. And if you made the mistake of walking past the officers, they would say, uh, oh, garçon, <laughs> uh, une demi uh, get me a half of bread. Will you with your throat chicken with Frank? You know, you're getting exactly the same salary, exactly the same people. Wearing that stupid uniform for one week and consciously you turn into an officer. So what Gandhi <coughs> is holding out for is very, very difficult. That we're going to keep distinctions but we're not going to regard them as differences in human value. You know, no matter what you do, you're playing a necessary role in society and the, the upshot of it all is that you're a human being along with all the rest of us. You're not better for being a professor. You're not worse for being a garbage collector. The question is just be a good professor and a good garbage collector. Remy. To uh, Amber Khan's eyes, how does this policy work to empower the non-European countries? How it would, it would just – you would get more privileges. You get a separate electorate. You'd vote for your own people, get them into Congress, and they would fight for you as opposed to fighting for the well-being of the whole in which you were included. And you know, it's a sad thing, but today uh, this is an issue around, Ga around which Gandhi is not understood. And the Harijans have voluntarily uh, rejected the, the title of Harijan. And they now call themselves Dalits or oppressed ones. So he's calling them the children of God and they're calling themselves the underclass, the oppressed people. So you, I, I've come across this many times where people actually would rather be labeled as a victim than not because you think you're going to get more privileges that way. It's, uh, it's a very deep problem and I know I've been talking with a lot of friends recently about how you – know, for example, yesterday I was talking to a psychologist who was saying we are trying desperately to bring spirituality into our profession. And uh, we've been doing the same thing with political activism. And I think it's because we're beginning to feel that these political criteria and these political categories are not enough. We're missing something. We just keep recycling the same problems <coughs> you know, with stuff. Okay, so that's, it's all very good. I don't want us to get too too far afield, though it's sometimes I admit it's hard to tell what the field was <laughs> really originally. But um, so the eventual arrangements actually in this case also were again a case of not a whole lot of quote work but some work. To quote Nanda, uh, just a crack in national life was closed for a while. But more important than these constitutional – this is page 191 if you want to go back and look this up. More important than these constitutional arrangements, which incidentally did not come into force for nearly four and a half years, was the emotional catharsis through which the Hindu community had passed. The fast had been intended to – this is quoting Gandhi – to sting the conscience of the, of the community into right 
religious action. So the scrapping of, of separate electorates was only the beginning of the end of untouchability. They would have to do a lot, and the point was to wake them up and to realize that they had to do this. So even if they had failed completely to do away with separate er electorates, which they did not, the thing worked in the sense that millions, this is not an exaggeration, millions of people said, oh my God, if he's going to die on us, there must be something horribly wrong with this that I did not understand. And his act served to awaken people. So that was the important point. Now, he was quite weak by now, so he was let out of prison shortly thereafter. And uh, let's get some of this stuff down here. So that's the epic fast, and it leads to the Yerapta Pact. Yerapta is the name of the prison. And incidentally, once again, Gandhi would call this place Yerapta Mandir. Mandir means temple. Because they actually had stationery made up where it said, from Yerapta Temple. Um, af after that, the Sadhyaga had kind of fallen apart. It wasn't at all clear where to strike next. And uh, Gandhi came to feel that this untouchability was the stumbling block to freedom. If they could get the Hindus to rid themselves of this temptation to despise another person because of birth, they would have so purified and strengthened their own position that then they could go to the British and say, you have no right to do the same thing to us. Okay? The logic is pretty clear. As long as we're doing it to people over whom we have that kind of power, how do we turn around and say to somebody else, don't do that to us? So this is, this is the one thing that advocate, those who advocate violence never understand. They always think that uh, you, can, you, you don't have to clean up your own act first. You have to dirty up somebody else's act. Um, and so from 1933 onwards, he launches on a grassroots campaign against untouchability. He tours the country, covers I think, you know, about 25,000 miles of touring. India is a very decentralized country with 700,000 villages. He, he tried to visit almost all of them. And he, this is also the year when he gives up the next to last ashram, Sabarmati ashram, and he turns it over to the Harijan Sevak Sangh. That means the Harijan Service Organization. Turns it over to them and, and uh, proceeds to tour the country going from village to village talking about getting rid of untouchability. Uh, and that lasted in for about three years. In 1936, he settled, he picked a small village called Segaon, which was like really like the Milpitas of, of India. <laughs> you know, nobody, there's no there there. And he purposely picked out this godforsaken little place that nobody ever went and decided to live there because in addition to untouchability, he is now working on village uplift. And I guess this is a good time for us to talk about constructive program, which is becoming formalized and which he's, he's, he puts more and more of his effort until the final Satyagraha in 19, early 1940s. He puts most of his effort into constructive program. So you I, you, I think you've got that little book, Constructive Program, Its Meaning and Place, and we've touched upon it in various ways. And I think I'd sort of open it up at this point and ask you, why was Constructive Program so important for him, strategically, philosophically, whatever. You'll remember that in the very beginning of the story, that in 1894, he when he was starting things out in South Africa, one of the first things he said was, in addition to protesting against our being downtrodden, we have to work within our own community for uplift of various kinds. So you've either 
read the chapter in my book or you've read constructive program in this booklet or you're just smart and you think about stuff and that's okay also. <laughs> uh, what do you think about it? Why is it so important? John? I would say two things. Okay. No fresh issues. No fresh issues. So would you do constructive program and talk about your other two issues? You could do that, those two at the same time. No fresh issue is between you and an opponent. It doesn't mean I just thought of another problem we've got that we've got to fix. And the reason for no fresh issue, you remember, is that you're negotiating with somebody and you're negotiating on various levels. And if you change your uh, demand just because you have more power, you're changing it from a conversation to a power struggle. So that, that's a rather restricted thing. It doesn't mean you could never think of anything else to work on. Yeah. Okay. So maybe let's just start strategically. Why was it so important to have constructive program going on? Even if you haven't thought about this before, it might be fairly obvious what was so great about it. Amy? Okay. The, yes. What Amy is pointing out is very important that in a – anyway, in this kind of problem, a problem of domination, the dominator – is always saying that you need us to take charge of your thing because you're not up to it. And so you say, no, we're going to show you that we can do it. That that takes away their main legitimate excuse for exploiting you. Now, let's be careful here, folks. We're not saying they will immediately stop exploiting you because that wasn't the reason. The reason they're exploiting you is they like it. It's their ego feels good when they do it. They get some money. All of those good things. But they it never yet has someone marched into a country and planted the flag and say, we're here because it makes our ego feel good to dominate other people. They always give you a reason. And at least you have to deal with that reason even if it isn't their underlying motive cause. Yeah. Yeah. Super important, yeah, self-sufficiency and self-respect. If you're asking others to respect you, you don't go to them hat in hand and say, we're helpless, we can't govern ourselves, we can't feed ourselves, please respect us. You wouldn't even feel much respect. We're going to revisit this interest in an interesting lay way as soon as we do the civil rights movement, incidentally, because Martin Luther King faced very similar things. Well, the, yeah, this is an important el element within constructive program was if you're exploiting other people, stop doing it. Yeah, that, and of course that was absolutely essential. You cannot – if you want to get somebody to do something that you yourself are not doing, the only way to accomplish that is through coercion. The only way to accomplish it through persuasion is to stop doing it yourself what you're calling the moral high ground. You have – not all the programs within constructive program had that characteristic. Like, you know, spinning would be different and uh, drinking, non-drinking and stuff like that. Okay, Paul? Yes. Right. Yeah. This is very important. We go, you know, rewind all the way back to our first lecture when we, we first began. Remember, we were struggling to get people off the waiting list and all of those satyagrahas were going on. The illustration that I started us off with was a case of positive energy versus a case of negative energy. And ultimately, this is almost too simple for us to grok, but we have to grok and it's very important. And 
that is constructed, the program is constructed. The, now that you've said it, it sounds obvious, but it's not obvious when you do that. Yeah. So it's always infinitely better to do something constructive than something destructive or even obstructive if you have a choice. And once you've done everything that you can constructively, then the oppositional program will be much more powerful. Coming from a different place. So let me just add to that that uh, strategically, it was it, it, there was a double, a triple advantage really to constructive programming. Right? Remember, one is it gave you something to do when you could not be obstructive. You know, you can't always call a march and expect a lot of people to come out. Various reasons. Sometimes that doesn't work. But you could always do constructive programming. And that led to a second advantage, which was very important, strategic advantage, was it was a way of keeping the community together. Even when you're not doing a campaign of some kind of resistance, you're sitting in your village out on the village Maidan, the village uh, square or meadow in the evening and there are films and it's like hundreds of people spinning their spinning wheel and producing their cotton, you felt a very deep connection with somebody, you know, a thousand miles away doing the same thing in their little village. And we know that working together bonds people more than any other force as a generalization. Symbols don't do it. Entertainment doesn't do it. Slogans don't do it. Costumes don't do it. Working on the same project doesn't. There's a book called In Common Predicaments by Sharif and Sharif, which uh, is a very good study from a sociological point of view of this phenomenon. So you've got a powerful bonding force which keeps the community together. And, uh, and so that means that when the next issue comes up that you have to be against, you don't have to start from scratch. And as someone who's been a quasi-activist for many, many years, I cannot tell you how advantageous this would be. Every time they start another war or whatever it is they want to start, we have to say, oh, where did I put my Rolodex? You know, who's still around? <laughs> and we have to start the thing all over again. And if only we had some constructive program keeping us going from uh, event to event, we, it would be so much more efficient. Now, the third thing, uh, the third strategic advantage that I wanted to mention is a mostly constructive program is legal. So you can do a lot of it without getting in the face of the opposition, without provoking them. And that would be a great advantage. That means when you do have to face off with them, you've built up all the strength and they didn't know to do anything about it. So you, it constantly provoking your adversary can be very wearing. It can be very exhausting. And in Cologne, where I had the opportunity to give a talk uh, on nonviolence, uh, I remember very vividly one member of the audience saying, you don't understand what the German police are like. You know, when we go out there, they beat us with sticks, man. And they kick us with those boots and that hurts. I don't want to go there. Uh, now, you may not have to go there or you, may ha you can go there less frequently if you found legal ways of building your strength up until the next time that a confrontation is necessary. And I believe that at the end of his life, Gandhi came to feel that if you would do constructive program right early enough, consistently enough, you never needed anything else. You would never need obstructive program. At some point, the British would look around and say, oh my God, what are we doing here? They don't come to our law courts. They don't come to our schools. They don't buy our cloth. We're not making any money here. There's no way to advance. They haven't converted to our religion. I, I just want to go back home. That's really the way things are going to work out in real life. Okay, any other points about constructive program? 
I think you have a sense now of why I, I'm so enthusiastic about it. Okay, so good. Where are we at? Uh, we're up to um, the breakout of World War II. Uh, and in 1942, the uh, Congress Party passes a resolution called Quit India, which was very in your face and provocative. And note that that is not where they started. They started by saying, let's reform this. And then when certain parts of it couldn't be reformed, they said, well, let's go to dominion status and we'll be part of the empire. And that was offered in the 20s. The British refused. In the 1930s, they said, well, okay, let's work out some kind of partnership. They refused that. And so finally in 1942, they said, get the hell out of here. Quit India. Uh, the final straw was that the nation woke up one morning to discover that it was at war with Germany. And they had never been asked. You know, nobody consulted them. They just said, you're part of our empire. Our empire is at war with Germany. Therefore, you are at war with Germany. And that degree of insult and that degree of unfreedom was so offensive that for many people, this was the final straw. They had tasted their strength and they knew that they could do uh, what they needed to do. And they said, oh, we just want you out of here. Um, now this was actually the last satyagraha of which Gandhi, in which Gandhi played an active part. Uh, he is soon going to actually quit the Congress party, which was his own creation. And mostly over the issue of the defense of India, he wanted to defend the country through nonviolence. And we're, we're talk about how he expected people to do that. Um, but they could not go along with him. And this, is, this has been repeated over and over again in the history of pacifism. You'll have a very strong pacifist movement building up until the outbreak of a war. Comes the war, nine-tenths of the pacifists step out and say, you know, that was a nice idea, but it doesn't work. And uh, next semester or next fall, once again, depending on how, how much we can get this act together. We're going to see a film called The Good War and Those Who Refused to Fight It. There were about 20,000 conscientious objectors in the U.S. during World War II. And that was a very hard war to be a conscientious objector in. So, but nonetheless, at that point, Gandhi felt, now, okay, now I have grown to the place where for me this is an absolute commitment. I will not take part in the war. And uh, it, he, he liberated the Congress to go, you go do your thing and I wish you the best, but it's not my thing anymore. Another feature of this era was his famous letter to Hitler. Uh, he wrote two famous letters, which the British authorities would not let him mail. So they never were received. But he wrote a letter to Hitler, which began, my dear friend, and he said, you are perhaps surprised that I call you my friend, but I have to tell you, I stopped hating people a long time ago. And he almost, so sort of between the lines, he's saying, hey, if I were gonna hate anybody, <laughs> you would be it. <laughs> but I can't and I don't. But he was extremely um, uh, courageous and he said in this letter to Hitler, you are no friend of the German people. Can you imagine? Now it's interesting, Hitler had in Mein Kampf, there is a reference to what Gandhi was doing in India. His, Hitler knew what the, what the freedom struggle was doing and he, and he said, we Germans have learned to our cost that the British will listen to nothing but force. So it's an interesting historical comparison because it shows you know, Hitler did not believe that Gandhi could possibly succeed. Gandhi was right, Hitler was wrong. And get right down to it. He also, uh, he also made a, uh, a very, uh, what shall I say, 
a very, a very harsh judgment about the war. Um, it's, it's not even an easy thing to think about, but I think if you look at what's happening today, uh, you would have to say that he had a point. This was, he was asked, what is going to be the outcome of the war? And he said, the Allies will prevail, but in order to do so, they will have to be more brutal than Hitler because they have chosen his method. You know, at the time, that looked like, you know, we, we don't do stuff like that. It's, it's, it's not true. But uh, you look at what's happening in our uh, government today. We're trying to say things like Guantanamo are okay. And you realize that in the course of time, that horrible prediction has come true. So I don't say this in a spirit of condemnation, but in a spirit of let's learn the lesson. The lesson is we got ourselves into this fix because we chose to fight Hitler on his own ground with his method. Anyone who does that is going to eventually be dragged down to the place that Hitler felt himself dragged down to. So that was another uh, event of this period. Uh, also, he wrote a famous letter called To Every Briton. It was addressed to the English people during the Blitzkrieg when uh, uh, Britain was being bombed and rocketed from the European mainland. Uh, and Gandhi advised the British people not to try to resist uh, Hitler's invasion, but to non cooperate with the German forces when they landed in England. And he advised the same thing to his fellow Indians. Uh, and this became today, there are two mechanisms today by which nonviolence can be applied to a large scale conflict, to, to war. And one is called civilian based defense, and the other is called third party nonviolent intervention. We'll talk a little bit more about TPNI or third party nonviolent intervention when we talk about Abdul Ghaffar Khan on Thursday. But here's basically how they work. Civilian based defense says that when you're invaded, you don't do what is called in military parlance, you don't do sh uh, shallow interdiction, you do deep interdiction meaning you don't prevent, try to prevent the enemy from invading your country because that's very costly. You're fighting over a symbolic barrier and the enemy is still in a strong position. You do deep interdiction, which means you let them come in if you have no choice, but you don't let them take over your institutions. You don't cooperate with them. And the classic example of this actually happened in 1968, it's known as Prague Spring, where uh, there was a, a reform within the communist uh, regime in Czechoslovakia. And uh, the Russian high command was very nervous about this and tried to get them to stop. The, uh, the president of, who came to power in Czechoslovakia at that time, Alexander Dubček, was very much in favor of the reforms. And uh, in the end, the Moscow ordered an invasion of 500,000 troops from three different directions. Czechoslovakia is just a small country. It's even, now it's two tiny countries, but then it was one small country. And uh, the Soviet high command predicted that Czechoslovakia would fall in four days. Eight months later, they still had not gained control of the country. And uh, Gene Sharp, who is a well-known strategic nonviolence uh, theorist, wa was working at Harvard and there was a Russian scholar there was in the early 80s. So Gene Sharp correctly assumed that he was uh, Secret Service and KGB. And he correctly assumed that he liked vodka. Pardon my cultural stereotype, but he took him to the men's faculty club at Harvard, which is really nice. I mean, you know, 
physically, Berkeley is a dump. We realize that. We just have to be kind of proud of that fact. But uh, the men's faculty club at Harvard is pretty posh. I got there once. <laughs> and <laughs> so he fed this guy up on a, a sufficient quantity of vodka and said, uh, well, I understand the Prague Spring didn't go for you. It didn't go very well for you. And he said, my, and my boy, it was a disaster. He said, not just Prague, the entire country. They simply could not control it. So there's a chapter in my book that tells about some of the funny things that they do, which uh, you, you, can, you can look into. But what this is what he recommended. Don't try to prevent the Japanese from coming in or at least don't try to prevent them by force. Stand there at the border, men, women, and children. People said, but you will be killed. Gandhi said, I, I'm sorry, this is very late stage. There is no better way for us to fix this. I wanted to build nonviolent resistance for the last 20 years, but I spent most of that time in prison. This is an emergency. Things are not going to be sweet. So yeah, they're going to kill us, but they won't be able to kill us twice. Said an army which marches over the mangled bodies of men, women, and children, to use his expression, would not be able to repeat the experiment. And he suggested the same thing in Switzerland and ultimately in Britain. At the time, it looked like he was absolutely crazy. Remember his formula? First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then they win. So he was in the laugh at you stage with this one. Now it doesn't look so ridiculous because it's actually been done in several places. And we'll look into that more closely in 164B. The other thing I want you to know about the Quit India Movement is the non-embarrassment issue. Because the British were fighting, he did not feel it was appropriate to launch full-scale satyagraha against them. So he, he launched symbolic satyagraha. Now this is not symbolic in the sense that I object to because it was real. There was a person named Vinoba Bhave who was supposed to go and offer satyagraha. He does, he does this. He gets arrested. So they send another person out. The point is we are not accepting your uh, regency in this country. We are not stopped our freedom struggle. But at the same time, we're perfectly well aware that your hands are full, you're occupied elsewhere, and we don't want to embarrass you in that technical sense. So that was, that was the way he got out of that. Okay, another th thing maybe I just – let's see. We've got about five minutes at this point. I don't know exactly how to use that. You, you guys all know that um, the – British had been operating behind the scenes to give a lot more prestige to uh, the leaders of the partition idea than they actually had among the people, uh, especially Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who becomes Gandhi's real adversary. At this point, this is probably one of the bitterest rivalries that he ever had to face. And there's a, there's a, there's a clip of a newsreel, which to me is one of the most moving uh, depictions of Gandhi and who he was that I've seen anywhere. And that is a, a, a scene of Jinnah and Gandhi going into a building together for a meeting. And you know, Jinnah is much taller than Gandhi. Almost everybody is much taller than Gandhi. And so you see Gandhi reaching up and putting his hand on that man's shoulder. Now, the, you know, Jinnah absolutely hated him. At that point, and he was ruining everything that Gandhi had worked on for decades. And still that man reached out to him in genuine love. And you see this in that film. And this is something that cannot be faked. You know, it's not like, hey, hey, hey. You know, he, he really, <laughs> <laughs> which is how I would probably do that. He really loved him as a human being. As a prologue to going in and trying to everything possible to get him to stop this drive toward partition. But the British were backing him. And as he was sometimes quipped in India, Jinnah had a problem for every solution that Gandhi could come up with. So partition happened. It was the most catastrophic, the most traumatic such political arrangement in, in history. Fifteen million people 
were rendered homeless. Uh, and today, we're still suffering from the shock waves of that uh, terrific rupture. And as you know, in uh, January 30th, the last day of 1948, on his way into a prayer meeting, he was assassinated by a Hindu fanatic uh, who was part of the uh, RSS or Black Flag movement, which now actually is the, un the illegal wing of, the, of, a, very, of a ruling party uh, in India. You know from reading Ishran's book that the very last thing he did in his life, his last words were Rama, Rama, Rama. That is, he was blessing the person who had shot him. Not understanding that Attenborough has him say, oh God, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh now what? You know, now they're assassinating me, what's next? Um, but that's not the way it actually was. He, he had people who were there who heard it with his very last breath trailing off, said they had never heard anything so moving and so pathetic in their life. The country was plunged into a state of absolute grief. And uh, William Shirer was there with talking to a fellow journalist, Ameri another American journalist in India who was, had never seen anything like it and was completely uh, unable to understand what was going on. So he asked this other journalist, asked an Indian a uh, colleague of his, what's happening here? And the man said, you know, we felt that in the Mahatma there was a mirror of the finest that is in us, of the greatest that we could become was mirrored in him. And now the people are afraid that that mirror has been shattered. So that would really explain that incredible outpouring. But I would maintain that uh, the mirror has not been shattered it's just for us now to put the pieces back together. We may not have the gilt frame that we had in Gandhi's day, but the legacy is there for all of us. So I'll close for today with that. And on Thursday, we'll look at uh, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, and then we'll, you'll bring it all back to me. So here are the, uh, here's the review terms if you want them. Here's these job opportunities, internship opportunities. And here's Yeah. And oh, my.